And as you're taking your seat, take your Bible out and let's open them to the book of Acts. Uh, I'm incredibly excited about being able to start a study on Acts today. Uh, There's a couple of reasons why I'm excited. One is uh, God laid on my heart uh, toward the Uh, the latter quarter of last year, which direction we would be going after the book of Hebrews. And so it's been a long time coming. Here we are in in May, and we're finally getting started on Acts after covering a a couple of great topics through the first quarter of this year. Uh, But that's, that's just one reason why I'm excited. A second reason why I am excited is because I've never done a study on the book of Acts. Uh, So I just want to share with you by personal testimony that the style of preaching that is used here at New Providence uh, has multiple reasons behind it. Uh, One is we're not the one who writes the lesson plan, God is, and so we go by expositional preaching, which is verse by verse through the Bible, but here's what that means for me. It means that every week I'm having to learn what the text has to say so that I can share it with you. And here's a truth that has always been true about church culture. Growing churches are always pastored by growing pastors. Amen? And the opposite is also true that stagnant churches are often pastored by stagnant pastors. And, and expositional preaching allows me week after week to continue growing because I'm preaching texts that I've never preached before. I've never done a study through the book of Acts. I'm so excited about what God's going to do in my life. Uh, he's also going to do a work in our church because the book of Acts is the first church history book recorded in Scripture comes right after the four Gospels. It's a church history book. So that, therefore, it, it lays out the, the groundwork or the framework for the original church. And so what do we get to do as a church 2,000 years later? We get to look back at that framework. We get to pay attention to what they built the church upon, what they grounded their beliefs in and their practices, and then we get to take a test, right? Right? To say, are we still doing that? Are we still doing church the way they did church? Because times may change, but the word of God never does. Amen? Uh, The authority, the instruction for the way we worship stays the same. And and we're uh, excited about diving into those instructions beginning today. So I had you turn to Acts chapter 1. I want to read the first 11 verses of this chapter, uh, and to honor the reading of God's holy word, I want to invite you, if you are able, to stand with me uh, as we read those 11 verses. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Father, may you bless the reading 
the teaching and the application of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now I want you to hear that last statement there in verse 11 as uh, Jesus or, or these angels saying, and this is the point of the book of Acts. There's a transition that we'll talk about in just a moment. But these angels are telling the apostles, stop standing here and looking at the one who just went up. There's work to be done. There will come a day when he's going to return in like manner. But until then, and then we have the whole book of Acts of the work that should consume your time, the spreading of the gospel. Uh, so I'm so excited about sharing this. We, we are now in the first book of church history. And to give you some, some context of, of what we just read, of the, of the time stamp, of, of where we find ourselves in uh, the layout of Jesus' ministry, is the book of Acts covers about 30 years of ministry. This 30 years goes from the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, which is 40 days after he, w he resurrected from the grave. So the day that he ascended into heaven, all the way to Paul's trial in Rome. So we're going to watch the gospel go from Jerusalem across the whole known world all the way to Rome as we study the book of Acts. Now, as we look at these 30 years, we, we also understand that the book of Acts is a recording of not only the apostolic works in the early church, but many of their sermons. Uh, this is a collection of sermons. There, is nearly, there are nearly 20 sermons recorded in the book of Acts. One third of the book are sermon notes. Uh, they are from Peter, from Paul, from James, from Philip from Stephen, and we get to read the very sermons that they preached of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole foundation of the church was built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's to be true of that today as well. Amen? Uh, this church is to be built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, there's been an extended name commonly assigned to this book called, and, and you've probably heard it, it might even be in your study Bibles, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I want to rename it for the purpose of our study through the book of Acts. More accurately, let's call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Uh, it, is, it is the recording of how the Holy Spirit used the people of God to do the work of God. Uh, so it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles instead of simply the Acts of the apostles. The, the man who wrote it, let's talk about him for a moment. His name is Luke. He is the same one who authored the gospel according to Luke, one of the four gospels. Uh, and he was a physician, not an apostle. He was a physician that traveled with the apostle Paul. He wrote the gospel of Luke and then Acts is volume two. You could even call it a sequel. Uh, and there's, there's no gap in between. There's even an overlap of where the gospel of Luke ends because it ends talking about the ascension. It ends talking about the commission to go outside of Jerusalem and go to the Gentile nations. It ends with the Holy Spirit coming upon you and empowering you. And that's where Acts picks up. It, it speaks of those same things. You can look to Luke chapter 24 and read it in tandem with Acts chapter 1 and see that they're covering the same events. Uh, now, who was it written to? We got two volumes uh, one about the life of Jesus, one about the life of the church, written to, this might be a surprise to you if you've never studied the beginning of both of these letters, uh, is a sing, it's written to a single man, uh, one man, one person. Now, now, figuratively speaking, many theologians have tried to take that one person and said, well, his name is Theophilus. Theophilus means lover of God, therefore the letter's written to anybody who loves God. Well, we know that because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible and he wrote it to those who love God as instructions on how to live out a life that's pleasing to God. But these two volumes were written to one man, dear Theophilus. You see it in Luke 1 and you see it in Acts 1. So what do we know about this man? Not much. Uh, we don't know if he was a believer. We don't know if he was a personal disciple of Luke. We don't know if he was an unbeliever, but we do know based on the way uh, Luke started the Gospel of Luke, is that he was sharing the evidence with Theophilus, 
that Jesus is who he says he is. So if he's a believer, Luke's strengthening him with, strengthening him with that information. If he's an unbeliever, Luke's laying out the evidence uh, to, con- to, to have him converted by the power of the gospel. So you got one volume about the life of Christ and another volume about the life of the church uh, and the work of Christ even after he ascended. Uh, in Acts, or actually in Luke, there is a reference to Theophilus uh, as most excellent one, or your excellency. So that gives us a little bit of clue that this guy was somebody important. Uh, we're going to assume from other historical accounts that he was a, a, a Roman dignitary. He was an official in Rome that Luke was writing to. Most excellent Theophilus. And then we have uh, volume one and volume two. Uh, Luke, uh, let's see. Luke wrote volume one as a narrative. That's why we call it the gospel according to, to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, and the gospel according to John. They were all looking at Jesus' life and recording about his physical ministry on earth. So the gospel of Luke is a narrative about the work Jesus did while he was here. He doesn't change that format when he shifts to Acts. Now he's talking about the work that Jesus did while he wasn't here. So think about it, because you've got Jesus' ascension, and then you've got the descending of the Holy Spirit, which is another one like Jesus. So volume one, Jesus is here in physical form doing the work himself. Volume two, Jesus is here in spiritual form doing the work through his people. And you've got him recording both and presenting them to Theophilus that the work must continue and Acts records that work. So here's the, here's the shift that happens in your Bible while you're reading the New Testament from the Gospel of John to the Gospel of Acts or, or the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The, I guess we could go with the Gospel of Acts, couldn't we? That was pretty good, wasn't it? It was an accident, but we'll, we'll go with it. So Here's the shift. You've got four books at the beginning of the New Testament that focus on Christ. And now the shift happens from Acts into the epistles, the letters to the church and the pastors of those churches, that the focus is now on the work that's being done in the people. So four books on the work that Christ did himself. The rest of the books, the work that he's now doing through his people. And and Acts being the first book that accomplishes that. Uh, as the recording of Acts begin, to do a little more uh, time stamping, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has just happened. Uh, it's, it's very convenient, this was the Lord's timing, not ours, that we're starting this right after the series we've had through Easter of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, because that's where this book begins. It's, in the, it's toward the end of the 40 days that Jesus spends on earth after his resurrection, but before his ascension. And we're going to look at the importance of those 40 days in just a moment. The church is very small at this time. It consists of, if you read the rest of chapter 1, which I would encourage you to do this week, it consists of 11 disciples. They haven't added a 12th one yet to replace Judas. They do that at the end of the chapter. It consists of a few women, and one of those women being Mary, the mother of Jesus, And then it it totals about 120 people. So let's talk about this small group of people for a moment. What have they experienced in the last month? All right, they've witnessed the, the trial of Jesus where they were scattered out of fear. Where they were running and hiding for their lives, fearing that they were next. They've witnessed the the crucifixion. They've had a day of solitude on on that Saturday as as Brother David preached on last week. And then they witnessed the resurrection. And several times since then, they've had the resurrected Savior appear to them in physical bodily form and tell them that their role is changing. It's now going to be your responsibility to carry the gospel of what you've just seen with your own eyes to the entire world. And so they've been through a lot. Uh, Luke 24, verses 46 and 47 say, Then he said to them, 
This is Jesus speaking to them during those 40 days. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. You've just seen that happen. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so we've got the the great commission. He says it uh, differently under Matthew's account. The way Matthew heard it was, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. But there was a command in there that Luke records, both in Luke 24 and in Acts 1, that you stay put until you receive power from above. So he gives them the commission. It's going to be your responsibility as the church to carry the gospel out from Jerusalem But don't go anywhere until you receive the same power that I served in while I was here on this earth. You're going to receive that same power in you to continue the work after I'm gone. It says in Luke 24, 49 and also Acts 1 verse 4, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on High until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke reminds us then in Acts 1 5 the words of John the Baptist uh, back during Jesus' baptism that took place in Luke chapter 3, his first volume. He reminds us of what was said there. If you look at verse 5, uh, it says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, we're not going to get into what that looked like uh, with verse 8, uh, and, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then the work begins and it branches out from Jerusalem. We're going to save that for next week. Uh, but I do want to cover the two events that happen on either side of Acts 1.8. And that is the proofs that were given by Jesus' 40 days of resurrected ministry. And then the empowerment or the lessons and the encouragement we can gain from his ascension. All right, so I want to look at those two things this morning as an introduction to Acts. What infallible proofs, as is mentioned there in verse 3, it says, to whom... He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. What proofs are presented to us by having a man who died on a cross, was placed in a tomb, and arose again and served 40 more days on earth in physical human form? What what proofs does that provide for us? And I want to give you a few. The first is his victory over death. That death was not final. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. It's not final for you either. It's just a doorway to pass from here to eternity in one of two places. Amen? Either in heaven or in hell, depending on the relationship with Jesus. Uh, So death is not final. The victory over death has been won. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 57 say, So when this corruptible, and Jesus Uh, Speaking of himself, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. It was his resurrected ministry that gave proof to that. Death has been conquered. Second infallible proof, Jesus' divinity. All right, his, his deity. The fact that Jesus is God. He was not just man. He was fully man, but he's also fully God. And his resurrected ministry proved that. 
It says in Romans 1, 3 through 4, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So, So him being able to arise three days later and continue serving was evidence that he was God's son, that he was deity, that he was divine. The third thing it proves, another infallible proof, is deliverance from the power of sin. Now, if you were here with us on Easter Sunday, we talked about the implications that come from viewing Jesus on the cross, but then leaving him there. Now you have a dead Savior. You've got the payment for sin, but you don't have life after that. You don't have the conquering of the grave. You don't have the supreme victory over the price of sin. You also don't have a king to serve because he's, he's dead. But what happens when that king on a cross dies and is placed in a tomb and then comes back to life and continues with his ministry? Right? Right? You now have a Lord, you have a a king on the throne that you serve with your life and there is victory, there is power over sin. Salvation is being set free from the bondage of sin. You are no longer held hostage to that sin nature. Yes, we still sin and yes, we still need to repent and yes, God forgives us, but you are not held in bondage to that. You've been set free from that and what's the evidence? Jesus is alive. Jesus took the price of your sin to the grave, but he didn't bring it with him out of the grave. Right? He came out without it. So there's been a a, a deliverance from the power of sin. It says in Romans 4, verses 23 and 25, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in Jesus who raised up, or believe in God, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. We serve a risen Savior who has justified us from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, if he's not risen, you're still in your sin. And so the fact that he is risen means we're not still in our sin, right? Right? That's an, that's an infallible proof. Forty days of earthly ministry in the resurrected form is proof that I have done away with your sin and the power of it. So Jesus' 40 days of post-resurrection ministry on earth testified to the proof that his atoning work was complete. He also gave testimony that his atonement was successful. Redemption, atonement, propitiation, satisfaction of God's wrath. It was successful and it was sufficient. I'm alive again, right? So think about this. His 40 days of earthly ministry after his resurrection is like him saying, God, oh oh man, this is good. God accepted the sacrifice. Think think about it. God accepted the sacrifice that I made on your behalf. Now get to work. Right? That's the motivation of the church. You get busy being representatives of the acceptable sacrifice who is alive and has ascended into heaven. And you will receive another one like me. Take the power that he provides and go out and be my witnesses to the rest of the world. The sacrifice was accepted. And now it was time for the gathering of God's people to get busy. Uh, So I want to look at the ascension. I told you we're going to jump on both sides of verse 8. So go to verse 9, Jesus' ascension. I want to read verses 9 through 11. It says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched. Now now just wrap your head around what's happening here. My my imagination was running wild uh, while I'm studying this text. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they're listening, Jesus is sharing his last words before ascending, and he was taken up right in front of them, and a cloud received him out of their sight. They're standing here, they're they're looking into the sky, they can't see him anymore. 
And these two angels appear around them. Two men stood by them in white apparel. And they said to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Almost like you're wasting time. <laughs> let's, let's get to work right now. He's gone. Holy Spirit's coming. Get to work. Uh, don't stand here looking into the sky. Uh, there'll come a day when you should stand there looking into the sky because he's going to come back very similar to the way he went. That's what it says there. Uh, standing there gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, there's two details given about the ascension that really tell us a lot about this event. The first one is the verb taken up. Okay, this was a, a verb that commonly referenced a promotion. Think about that. So what happened at the ascension? This is the first time that Jesus in human form went to heaven. Right? So his, his bodily form at the ascension received a promotion. And what was that promotion? To go from earthly ministry as a servant savior to a heavenly ministry at the right hand of God as a mediator and an inter interceder in the power seat as king and Lord, right? And so there, this, this taken up in the ascension is a, is a spiritual promotion of Jesus' earthly body from earth to heaven. And then it says that it, a cloud received him. So anytime you see a, a cloud playing a role in Scripture, it is referring to God's presence. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, go to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. Moses is on the top of the mountain to meet with God. A cloud engulfs the mountain and God gives Moses the law. Right? So cloud representing presence of God. All right, let's fast forward to where to set the temple up in the wilderness. Both at the end of Exodus, also in Numbers uh, that, that glory cloud, it's going to move, and wherever it stops, you put the ark there, build the Holy of Holies around it, build the, uh, the tent of meeting around it, place of worship, set your camp up, stemming from the inside out. And then you want to talk about frustration? Uh, if you go and read numbers about when that cloud moves, it says, and, and you leave it set there, and you function in worship the way the law tells you to, and you make sacrifices every morning and every night and once a year, Day of Atonement, uh, but keep that ark positioned under the cloud, and whenever it moves, you know it's time to move the temple. And, then it, and, and in Romans, it says, even if it's only been 24 hours. So think about, you, you're getting busy. Okay, the cloud stopped. Let's set it up. Let's start worshiping. It. Oh, man, it's moving again. So you take, it all, you take it all apart. Let's go again. But why would you want to be somewhere worshiping where God is not? Right? You, so we worship God and his presence, and you want his presence to fill this place. And if, man, heaven forbid it ever leave this place, we need to leave too, right? Uh, we want to worship where his presence is reigning over us. And, and that's the symbolism there in Exodus and also in Numbers. But then again, let's go to the New Testament. Let's think about the three disciples on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. What happens then? A cloud and Jesus is called up. Now, I told you my imagination was running wild while I was studying these three verses and here, I'm, I'm making this up. So, so I'm going to step aside from the pulpit for a moment. Here, here's what I think happened. They're standing there. Jesus is talking to them. He gets taken up. Cloud consumes him. He can no longer be seen. Peter, James, and John look at the rest of them and say, we've seen this before. He'll be right back. These two angels show up and say, no, he won't be right back. Now, you know, it's time for you to get busy in his absence. He'll come back, and he's going to come back much like he just left. But it's not going to be like it was when you were on the mountain with him. Right, So, so that, could have, that could have played a part in it. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the meaning of the text. But just imagine some of the comments they were having for, with one another, standing there looking into the, the sky, and their Lord, ascent, the, the resurrected Lord, has just disappeared. He has vanished, consumed by, uh, received by this cloud out of sight. And these two angels come and say, don't stand there wasting time looking 
where he went. He's going to come back. But until then, you have work to do. And that's what the book of Acts records. The work that they began to do and the work that shall continue today through us as the church. There's work to be done, and when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you will have what it takes to do the work. So I want to I leave you with this thought this morning. While we are down here with the indwelling Holy Spirit, doing the work that He has both called, commissioned, and if David was here, he'd give me another C, wouldn't he, Kurt? So, so he, he, he's called us to do this work. He's commissioned us to do this work. How about consumed? He's consumed us with the Holy Spirit to do this work. But I want to add a, another level to that. While we're doing that work, Jesus is in heaven doing his work. We need him to keep doing his work of interceding and mediating while we continue to be faithful down here, serving Him and representing Him, uh, ministering to others on His behalf. Uh, so I want to I kind of leave you with that thought because the Holy Spirit that we'll talk about next week is uh, another who is like Him, a comforter, one who is exactly like Him that's now indwelling us while He's up there, doing His work at the right hand of the Father. And so what I want to do to kind of drive that thought home, we are going to sing about that truth of the dual ministry that's happening. Jesus at the right hand interceding, us serving down below with the power that he provides. And so as Leon comes back to the stage, I want to read to you the lyrics of the song that we're about to sing. Before the throne of God above, I want you to listen to the truth that is in this song about what the ascension should mean to us. That Jesus is no longer here on earth. He's sitting beside God the Father in heaven, ministering on our behalf while we minister on his behalf. Isn't that beautiful? Listen to these words. I got them printed there at the bottom of the notes. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Nothing can separate me from the work that he's doing. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within... Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. There's that infallible proof. Who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my savior and my God he's up there ministering on my behalf I've been called down here to minister on his. Amen.